the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are feared. As we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a call and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions. Make them to ask such things as please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the ninth Sunday after Trinity is written in the second book of Samuel, the 22nd chapter. 
With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem tortuous. You save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you, I can run against a troop, and by my God, I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is written in St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example but they are written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, 
one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who is spoken by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dear friends in Christ. With the Olympic Games well on their way, perhaps you are consumed with the spirit of competition and the excitement that comes with national pride as we root on the Americans in Tokyo. Or maybe you're not. I don't know. But it is a little strange, I don't think that you would argue, that if you do turn on the television, that you see the stands nearly empty. 
No one, hardly anyone, is there to push those athletes harder to victory, to cheer them on when they're winning, or maybe even more to the spirit of the games, to try to motivate them, encourage them when they're losing. And all of us understand losing. And I would imagine that maybe if you started to think about it, you could count up more times in your mind when you came in second place or third place or last place more than you did coming in first. A couple of weeks ago, Andrea and I were in Springfield, Illinois, and we were at the Lincoln Library and Museum. And growing up in Illinois, we got taught a lot about Lincoln. And so I was reminded about something that I had almost forgot. That Abraham Lincoln lost many more times than he ever won. And that even for the race of presidency against Stephen Douglas. That Douglas was more organized, he was more financially supported than Lincoln, and he just came off a loss to Douglas for the Senate. Lincoln was the underdog. And you understand that role, the role of underdog. And perhaps if you're watching a competition, you, if you have no other vested interest in one particular team or the other, you might desire to root for the underdog. You want to see the little guy do well. And the same with the stories in the Bible. Sometimes, we like to root for the guy who is the underdog. I'll give you a couple examples. You think about Joseph in the book of Genesis. His dad was Jacob. His brothers didn't like him too well, right? I mean, he had these dreams, and they seemed to focus more on how Joseph is going to be lifted up by God, so his brothers sell him off into slavery, into Egypt. But that, of course, is not the last word. The Lord raises up the underdog Joseph, and he becomes this great ruler. And perhaps the best example of an underdog that we find in the Scripture is that of David. We call him King David, the ultimate underdog. The Lord chose him long before he or anyone else knew it. You see, the prophet Samuel was directed by God to go to Jesse's house because God had determined that one of Jesse's son was going to be the next king for Israel. Now, Saul had fallen to disuse or disservice, or at least he was rejected by God as king. And so Samuel sees the oldest of Jesse's son, a guy by the name of Eliab. And he saw how big and tall and strong he was. And Samuel thought, surely this is the man that God desires to anoint as king. But God says to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. David was not the front runner in anyone's book, even in his own father's book. But God had other plans. He most definitely was the underdog who became king. Now, now, here's the point of me telling you all of that. You see, God sees things differently than we do. If we consider the life of man, or especially the life of a man like King David, a clear underdog to begin life, I still don't think that even though he came to power, that any of us would really even want that life, underdog or not. At first, we might think that he had the greatest of great lives because he was king after all, but then we take a little bit of a closer look. We examine scriptures and we find out David was not all of that and he didn't have all of that. Remember that David was pursued by King Saul and David had to run for his life and he was in hiding for many, many, many months. Remember that King David had a son by the name of Absalom that wanted him dead, and so he had to run from him too. Remember that David's life was wrought with scandal. 
whenever he took the woman Bathsheba to be his own and had Uriah, her husband, put on the front line to die in battle. And besides all this, David was about the business of wars and against some people that God would have him raise up against. And so his life was constantly in flux, maybe always in jeopardy. A life like David's, when you get right down to the details, isn't all that glorious after all. But in the midst of it all, David sang the praises of God. The true underdog king that came from nothing and then was granted prominence by God himself, who lived life not according to God's will all the time, still was a man after God's own heart. And God gave David a blessed life and a blessed journey through life in all of its hardships, in all of its challenges. And David recognized this. And this is what we hear in the Old Testament reading from today. Because what we hear is David exclaiming to God and before all that the Lord is still his Lord and that he gives thanks for the Lord who loves him so. So we hear these words. As for God, his way is perfect, says David. The word of the Lord is flawless, says David. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. Yes, lowly King David. Yes, everything that David went through, the underdog king. King David, who had nothing, and the king who had everything. The king that was at the same time poor and also rich. The king who was loved and yet hated. The king that was all-powerful. And yet, when you're even running from your own son who wants to take your life, the king who was the weakest. You see, perhaps we forget that a life like King David's is indicative of the life of even the most powerful and the most famous in all the world today. I know what you see because I see it too. Lives of glamour are glorified. People want to be like the rich and famous. But seldom do we think about how their life really is behind the scenes. The trouble that may rot their hearts, the things that they have to put up with that none of us have to, and we only covet the good part. Just like God can see the hearts of man, could see the heart of David, just like he could see into the heart of his chosen and anointed, God can see right into the heart of every single one of us. And God, believe you me, knows your victories, and he knows your defeats. He knows your sorrows, and he knows your great joys. He knows your victories. He knows when you have failed. He knows the good parts, and he knows all the struggles. He knows what's good about you, and he knows what is bad about you. That's right, you that too. And you know, as well as I know, If you really know this, it's really a good thing that God can see all of that. I know you want to hide it away. I know you want no one to know about your sins. I know that you would love to just to be able to crawl into a rock whenever things go poorly for you, whenever our failures are magnified, when embarrassments do come to the surface. We see them and they are magnified whenever they are a reflection of us and our character, even before those people, like the people that are sitting next to you, that you don't want them to know. But you know that God knows all of your glorious parts and all of your faults. He knows all of your joys, and he knows all of your sins. And this is a good thing, that he knows these things. Even though I know how you are, you want to even hide those things from God. I know that a lot of people that I have spoken to, many different Christians, who don't feel as they 
are worthy to be in the midst of the Lord's house with people like you and me. Oh, if they only knew the sinners that are in this room, right? Or maybe that they think that they can't even face God, that they need to go home and get their house in order first before they come to the Lord's table. And they forget that it is a place like this that is a hospital for sinners. A place like this that God cleanses us from our unrighteousness. It is a place like this that is built for people like them, for people like you, and for people like me. And that there's no going home and getting our house in order before coming to this house first. Because this is the first house that we come to in the time of our need, in the time of our sorrows, in the time of our suffering, in the midst of our sins, to come and to repent and to say, the Lord, please cleanse me of all of my unrighteousness, for I need you today. Believe you me, the Lord knows. He knows your heart, and he desires to forgive you of all of your sins. So no matter how angry we are, maybe about what we have done or somebody has done to us, no matter how angry or upset we are at this world, no matter if it's, it's people, no matter if it's our government, no matter if it's a new mask mandate, no matter what it is in this world, it is nothing compared to what God has given to you. And we even sang this this morning in that hymn we just finished. What is this world to me? In the fourth stanza, my Jesus is my treasure. My life, my health, my wealth, my friend, my love, my pleasure. My joy, my crown, my all. My bliss eternally. Once more than I declare. What is this world to me? With Christ, there is something so much more. And in the midst of this place that you're at with other sinners that need the cleansing of God from all unrighteousness, this becomes our little treasure, our little place of heaven, away from the world where God gifts us with what we do not deserve. And this blessed thing really does give us even more than all those superstars have. It gives us more than every underdog than we would ever be able to root for. It gives us a life eternal that we know that we do not deserve, but we have in his blessings. And he has chosen you, beloved in the Lord, to love, to forgive, to be a Christian out in this world, to not hate, but also to come alongside of and be with those who are in danger or in sorrow or in sickness or even in health. We have a king greater than King David, the underdog, the, the, the sinner that he was, the, the most loved man that he was. And today, God continues to use humble means to come to you and me today like bread and wine in communion, like water and holy baptism, through the speech of words to grant us life and forgiveness. And because of all this, that we have this gift, that we are made free and alive to approach the holy throne of God. You see, he has cleansed us from all of our righteousness, no matter what big sins that you have, or no matter how bad you want to hide from God or others. King David says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. The underdog needs a Lord. The sinner needs our Lord. And beloved in the Lord, we have him. He is our place. He is our refuge amidst this world. And what of it? This is our place to be. This is the place to be for you. So we sing with David in a loud voice, for he has given us his great gifts of life everlasting. God's peace and love rejoice in you. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
In our prayers this day, we remember those who are listed in our bulletin. We pray also for those that are named this week for Nancy Johnson, the sister of Pat Toylan, regarding health concerns for Fred Hagemeyer, who is the brother of Be Beverly Bartak, uh, recovering from surgery. Also, we've been asked to uh, remember in our prayers Karen and Scott Snyder, who's the sister of Kelly Henricks. Uh, both of them are hospitalized with COVID. We also pray for Roger Berkey, who is the brother of Wilma Chandler, who will be having surgery this week. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Merciful Father, you show mercy to us poor sinners. Lead us to acknowledge your mercy with gratitude, that in turn we may be quick to show mercy to others, and give us a right understanding of our own weaknesses and frailty. Preserve us from pride, and lead us instead to cling to Christ and his forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us a right fear of you, O Lord, that we would not abandon your truth. Give us a right love of you, O Lord, that we would, not, that we would fervently show mercy and thereby cover a multitude of sins. Give us a right trust of you, O Lord, that in repentance we would return to our baptism daily and in faith receive Christ's body and blood in this supper. Lord, in your mercy, uphold our nation and give us good government. Let those with authority not only be shrewd in their dealings, but also act with love, righteousness, and devotion to the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for the sick and suffering especially Ron, Paul, Liz, Bradley, Blake, Joyce, Lisa, Brian, Crystal, Rick, Greg, and Oscar, Dorothy, Pat, and Pat, Carrie, as well as Marlene, Karen, Diane, as well as Bernadette, Warren, Karen, Tom, Norma, Greg, and John, Craig and Karen, Bob, Virginia, as well as Nancy, Fred, Karen and Scott, and Roger, and all those that we name before our hearts. Give them strength to endure their trials until you remove them. Lord, in your mercy, give true repentance and faith to those who commune this day, that they may eat Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of sins and in the unity of true confession. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings that you so freely bestow on all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth adored, heaven and earth with full acclaim, shout the glory of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest, sing Hosanna to the Lord. He who comes in the name Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption that you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of the cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.